Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight for our next virtual event with Mandy Johnson and Christina Catherine Martinez and company to celebrate Mandy's book launch for Super Serious, an oral history of Los Angeles's independent stand-up comedy with a collection of comedian portraits from a decade of the beloved independent comedy show, The Super Serious Show with a foreword by Dimitri Martin, afterward by Reggie Watts, and featuring big name stars and up and coming indie comics alike, Super Serious gives a behind the scenes glimpse into the world of Los Angeles independent comedy, as told by the performers, directors, and producers who've helped shape it. Including over 60 intimate interviews and 350 photographs, Super Serious is an irreverent loving portrait of a vibrant and very funny community, which you can purchase right below um, at the bottom of the screen with the um, from the green button and you can actually book soup is the only place you'll be able to get a signed copy so that's exciting and if you click on it even throughout the show it'll open in a new screen and it won't interrupt this um, presentation so thank you all for taking time out of your Thursday evening to join us virtually and for regular updates on upcoming events um, please feel free to subscribe to our email newsletter follow us on social media at book soup and you can also come to our crowdcast page directly this evening's virtual event will end with a Q&A um, or might be scattered throughout. And to submit a question, please use the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. And if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the like button and we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And with that said, let me introduce our moderator for tonight's event. I'm actually gonna bring her on screen first. Christina, welcome, is a comedian, writer, actor, and award-winning art critic. She writes for Art Forum, Art Agenda, Tex Zerkunst, did I say that right? It's and, German, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes for TV, including the Eric Andre show on Adult Swim. She was named as a comic to watch in 2020 by Time Out LA. Her book of essays, Aesthetical Relations, was published with Hess Press last year. The first edition is sold out, but the second edition of the book is coming soon, so stay tuned. And you can find her online at xtina underscore Catherine. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn over the camera to Christina to introduce the rest of our guests tonight. Um, so please sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. And thank you all for being with us tonight. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I wish I was actually off screen for that intro because then I just had to sit here looking humble when I was really just enjoying it so much more than I wanted it to look like I was enjoying it. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much. We have a, a wonderful crowd going. I think uh, housekeeping, I think we want to uh, submit a question anytime you want. I think we're going to try to just scatter them throughout this talk and hopefully it's going to be less like a you know, a, a cut and dry, you know, intellectual panel and more just like a fun podcast kind of vibe with a bunch of friends that have marketable chemistry, but don't talk over each other. I think that's that's what we can all shoot for. And I know we're all here to celebrate Mandy. So without further ado, I'm gonna do something a little bit formal. Uh, Mandy Johnson was born in Chicago and raised in Indiana before coming out West. Um, she is an acclaimed comedy producer, photographer, and now motherfucking author of this amazing book, Super Serious, an oral history of Los Angeles independent stand-up comedy. Um, whether it's for advertising or editorial personal work, Mandy's work captures the rawness of vulnerability and sincerity of her subjects, which makes her so perfect for shooting comedians. Um, in addition to her photo work, Mandy is the co-founder and executive producer at Cleft Clips, a comedy-oriented production company behind popular live shows such as The Super Serious Show and Hot Tub with Kurt and Kirsten. Please, with welcome. Ah, there you are. Hi, Mandy. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> Was, it, was the intro okay? We did it. Was beautiful. It was perfect. I was very happy. I was off screen. I got a little emotional during it for no reason. I wrote. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I had. I, it, it was awkward because she's. There's the other person on the screen talking about you, and I was like, I have to. How do, how, how do we look? How do we you, look humble? You, well, look this is, you looked very humble. You looked down, and you're like, yes, yes. This is good. <laughs> well, um. Welcome, we're super, I'm super psyched to have this book and I'm psyched that I got it early and I've been able to leap through it 
Um, I'm super happy that you're doing this with me and so is everyone else. Thank you. First, before we bring everybody else on, I wanted to talk to you specifically just about the photography aspect of the book, um, because it is, as most of you probably know, it's a bunch of portraits shot on this beautiful four by five, what is it, a vintage Polaroid camera? It's a four by five, yeah. Um, I've shot most of them now on a Toyo um, field camera. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I started the show, I shot them on my Horseman LX that I had from school. Uh, I went to a photo school that made you get a four by five. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I bought a four by five for that. And then I never got rid of it when I moved to LA because I figured it was one of those things you would never rebuy if you sold, you know? Like you would just yeah, 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 yeah. get a four by five again in a world of digital. And then when we when we took Super Series Show to the Fringe in Edinburgh for a month, I was like, oh, I can't travel with this thing that's larger than my suitcase. And so <laughs> I bought a, um, a field camera, which folds up to be about like this yeah. camera tank. Um, amazing. Well, I guess I wanted to talk about your photography a little bit before we bring everybody else on and talk about comedy because it's such a huge project. Like there's 10 years worth of portraits in here with all these interviews. So it's this really interesting document that brings together a lot of disparate thing, parts of you, but it also feels such like an organic, like whole project. And I'm wondering, I mean, I guess I wanna know what was the motivation behind starting this habit in the first place of like 10 years ago, you're starting the show and, and did you ever, and the process of that now turning into this book, like when did it dawn on you or how did it come up that like these things can go together and live together as this project? So they started really as um, just a very, when we started Super Series Show, it was just to be part of the community. We didn't think that it would evolve into us running our own company and being more involved in doing content and you know bigger, large events or live events and branded events and things like that. We just kind of started it because we liked comedy and we wanted to, you know, produce something that we liked and that we could have curated. And so we knew we needed kind of a version of the comedy ball that you would see at a club where it's like, oh, this is who's done the show because yeah. we're first and we wanted to be able to point to something to show other comedians, like, look, you can trust us, like these people. Are <laughs> totally. Right? Totally. And and we needed SEO. We needed traffic to drive from the, to the site, you know, and, and so that's very cynical reasons. And and then, you know, probably, you know, thirdly, we were like, oh, comedians couldn't use some photos. Like 10 years ago, it was rough times to get photos of comedians. And um, I started shooting them on my 4x5 kind of as a lark. And yeah. I shot the first, uh, the first um, show, which is in the book together of David Keckner, Moshe Kasher, and Nigel Lawrence. Mm -hmm. I shot an actually fully expired 10 year old Polaroid and it was bright blue. And so in Photoshop, I shifted it to be really warm or warmer. And then over the years, I kind of built a profile to like match or kind of like fall back to that. And then you can kind of see the progression through some of the portraits in the book. Um, you can see the progression even more. I mean, this is only about a little less than 30% of the photos are in the book. Wow. Um, my website's the full series, which is over 1,400 photos, I think, now. Um, and so you can really kind of see the progression of, of the kind of the filter layer process, like kind of coming into like the final. Oh, you know. that, that, that's interesting because they are, I mean, and actually this is, a, someone asked a question about your process, which I think is relevant. He said, how did you manage to keep visual color shooting style consistent over a decade of shooting the portraits? And it's funny that you, how much you say the process <laughs> has evolved because they do, they do read as remarkably consistent, at least like in the portion that's in the book. So, I mean, you've just, is it, do they get Photoshopped or changed afterwards? Photoshopped, but they're all like a little, like Polaroid is a finicky medium. And so like some batches you get shift into a color palette than more than others do like some are more blue or cyan or or maybe like the lighting wasn't exactly the same i mean it, it all it all pretty much stays the same for show but like when we travel <laughs> we <can't> have <laughs> sorry hot water it went down the wrong too take your time when we, travel, <laughs> when we travel sometimes like you're in a more cramped space or whatever you know and 
and so I would say that I've always tried to keep it fairly similar and I use like the same, you know, I use like the same uh, layers, but each person's a little bit different. Like your hair colors are different, you know, people. Yeah, yeah. It's all like a, a slight fluctuation. So I'm always harsh on myself that I feel like it's not really consistent. So it's, it's nice that people think it is. No, no, no. I mean, that first photo you talked about, you can you can kind of tell, but it's funny because I think I don't, the photos are, don't necessarily appear in any kind of chronological order. They're no. it's, it's taken from all across this decade and there's maybe someone, like there could be a photo of like Sarah Silverman that you took like five years ago next to a picture you took of like someone else like a year ago. And that is, they do read as Mark, is there, is there any, you don't have to name names, but like, has there ever been photos that just like didn't work or got destroyed or maybe like stuff you wanted to put in there that just didn't come out well enough to put in the so book? Recently, I only take two cores of every performer at every show. I think I've reshot less than 10 and I've only Ooh. reshot them when they blinked. Uh, I count and everything. And I think the most disappointing ones as a whole are when it's kind of like there's one serious for everybody. Yeah. And one like silly or super serious or like whatever emotion you want to whatever you want to do but it's always the crazier the better is always the best on those and so when yeah. someone like gives like a like a nice pretty smile which is pretty <laughs> it's not really as fun as i would like it to be yeah so those may be the ones that are like a little bit more disappointing but they're also Nice can we can we get a running list of everyone that gave you a disappointing photo? No, I don't have that. But you can judge for yourself. You can go to my website and look at all <laughs> the ones that you think are the most disappointing. Actually, so. this is gonna there what there's yeah, I think this is gonna be a fun group activity. I think if like all 70 of us can like go to Mandy's site after the show and we're gonna pick out the people that we just think look like assholes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And then we'll have our own group chat about that later. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. I'm honestly, I'm so impressed. Not just like the discipline of being that consistent, but having a vision, such a strong vision, like, like as it to just be like an alternative to, um, yeah, the, the club wall and the fact that comics need photos. And, and then it, tur it definitely turned into this big, and it definitely made the, the show very known because by the time I started doing comedy, sure. yeah, yeah. it became a thing where people were like, "Oh, I'm happy for the spot, but I really came for the photo." Yeah, Ugh. I mean yeah. both, both like because the photos are such a signature style. Now I was just like, "Oh God!" Like look at, I could just see by the time I started doing comedy and became aware of the show, I could just tell by the style of the photo that it was taken at super serious. So I'm like, "Oh wow, that you know that guy did super serious. That's a." I want to be on that show, you know? Um, but did you ever, like, when did it start turning into what I, I think as the book? People started asking me if I was going to do a book. Then I started being like, oh, maybe I should do a book. And then it was a very long process of like, oh, how do you do a book? And then people were like, oh, you need a book agent. And I was like, oh, how do you get a book agent? And then my really good friend, and then I just started asking around, and my, and my good friend Molly Perez, She's the one who introduced me to my great book agent, Monica Scott. And uh, then Monica challenged me to um, really think about how to set the book apart from other photo books and how to make it different and unique in my own and something that would say something. Because yes, I think the portraits are all beautiful, but I think a book of just solid full page portraits would be very boring after a while. Maybe people would disagree but that's what I think. Um, <laughs> and so coupling it with the interviews and letting the community kind of tell the story of independent comedy um, is what we kind of settled on. And it felt natural for me because I didn't want to be like the mouthpiece for it. I wanted the community to be able to speak and have opinions about what we all thought about it. So. Yeah, no, that's great. It's, I don't know how to say this without sounding corny, but it feels like a community i'm not going to say community project it's <laughs> can't talk about community um i think it's a good time to bring on our guests i'm gonna do you think uh should i read everybody's uh intro and then we'll bring them all on at once sure okay so 
Um, we're very excited to have um, some comedians who have also been interviewed. Like everyone that's here today has been interviewed for the book. Um, uh, Chris Gar we're gonna Chris Garcia is a comedian, television writer, and podcaster. You may have seen his half hour special on Comedy Central, uh, This Is Not Happening, Adam Devine's House Party, and At Midnight. He has written for Comedy Central, MTV, Adult Swim, and is currently writing and acting on Gabrielle Iglesias' Netflix sitcom, Mr. Iglesias. You can listen to Chris on his podcast, Scattered, produced by WNYC Studios, which Time Magazine, Huffington Post, and The Atlantic called one of the best podcasts of 2018. You can follow him on Instagram at Rad Tuna and Twitter at underscore Chris Garcia. I think we should all maybe just put our handles in the chat at some point, uh, which makes sense. And I lost my my tab. Uh, our actually our next guest is Dave Anthony. Dave Anthony is a comedian, writer, actor, podcaster, and he is the co-author with Gareth Reynolds of the United States of Absurdity, based on their ongoing history comedy podcast, The Dollop. He was an actor and writer on Marin on IFC, and most recently wrote for Deadly Class on Sci-Fi. He's performed stand-up on The Jimmy Kimmel Show, The Late Late Show, and Comedy Central. And his album, Shame Chamber, and Hothead are available on Bandcamp. You can find him on Twitter <laughs> at Dave Anthony and on Instagram at Dave underscore Anthony underscore. We're gonna just do that in the, I think we're just gonna put those in the chat. I'm working on it, I'm working on it. Okay. <laughs> uh, I we're gonna, everyone's gonna have to say their name when they come on, because I realize we're not seeing you right now. And um, our last panelist is Shara Schaefer. Sarah Schaefer is a critically acclaimed stand-up comedian, writer, and producer. She is the co-host of MTV's late night show, Nikki and Sarah Live. Her Comedy Central stand-up presents half hour special debuted in November of last year. She has won two Emmy Awards for her work at Late Night with Jimmy Fallon and won a WGA Award for her work on Ed Helms' Comedy Central special, The Fake News with Ted Nels. Sarah's book, uh, Grand, a memoir, is available now wherever books are sold. And you can find her online at the handle that we're gonna get in the chat shortly. <laughs> oh, there is everybody. I, 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 I went out of the window to be able to read the bio. So you can see your name. So thank you. Let's just all raise our hand and say our names. <laughs> I'm Christina. <laughs> Andy. Oh, Chris. Sarah. David. <laughs> Hey, this is just for somebody, um, but Joel or Monica, can you please put all of our handles in chat? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you were coming on as I was reading or if it was at the end, but I, people need to know which bio goes where. Um, yeah. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being amazing comedians and part of this book. Uh, I, I did really want to just kind of uh, have a, get a conversation going, and I, Mandy and I thought that the first question to really get that going, which I want, I want to hear from Monica, uh, from Mandy, how that informed the book. But we we're talking about just the how we are, how we define independent comedy, which we may, and if we do or do not differentiate that from what for lack of a better word is called alt comedy. <laughs> and um, I guess we could start with Mandy because I know you definitely you talked about, you had a very strong definition in mind for what independent comedy meant for the purposes of this book and for the work that you do as a producer, correct? Well, yeah, I just think that the phrase alternative comedy is dumb. It doesn't really like define anything specifically. I find that Personally, I think comedy is comedy, and <laughs> the comedy is somehow putting down a styling or a, a subgenre of comedy. Mm -hmm. And I always found that to be frustrating, and um, maybe uh, I'm overprotective, but I find it to be a little bit demeaning towards the comedians themselves. And so I think that what it meant to say is. And because how we use it is describing independent comedy, is describing comedy outside of clubs. Yeah. And so I don't, I think that, sure, maybe clubs are, are quote unquote mainstream at some point, but that doesn't mean that what happens outside of a club is alternative. It's just not inside a club that also slings food. Yeah. So it's really just describing like a very specific system. My really like, stance on it, guys. Yeah, yeah. 
But it was funny, and I don't know what anyone else's like experience is with that specifically. Like, what what this system has like done for you as a comedian that like the club system couldn't or didn't. Do you know what I mean? I th I think you have less uh, opportunity to sort of be yourself in a club. I think that. Uh, the independent rooms, as they're called, allow you to explore more and the audiences are usually more forgiving. And then also, I think that the I think that people just go to see comedy when they go to a comedy club, whereas I do feel like people that go to the independent shows are specifically looking for a certain type of comedy. If that makes sense. Yeah. And would you call that? And I'm not going to bring up the word alt again. Um, <laughs> Or Chris or Sarah, do you have any thoughts on that personally? Yeah, I mean, it feels ahead, like the club. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sarah. No, you. Sarah, yeah. you've got headphones on. You're ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be any feedback loop in here. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I would have loved to have been in clubs when I started uh, doing comedy, but I couldn't get in there. You know, it's like, I think it's. Uh, I mean, there was open mics everywhere. You could choose your open mics, but it, you know, independent shows were more accessible for a younger comic. After that, after you pass the open mic level and you're getting booked, so many booked shows for younger comics are run by other comics or fans of comedy producers um, who love comedy that. Um, are more on the ground and going to be around in that community and see mm -hmm. everybody out at shows as opposed to a club is very much like a, a like a central magnet and the mm -hmm. booker never goes anywhere else. The booker, ne like unless you do well at that open mic, you're not gonna get booked until you have a name for yourself. So um, in New York, I just, I, I started in New York and those, those alternative shows, Sorry, independent shows were, well, no, because I hated that term too, because, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I see, um, you know, yeah, you could, I mean, I, my very first show in New York City was in a stand-up club, and it was weird. What I did was weird. It didn't yeah. fit in that world at all, but I still did it there, you know, and it, it, it got laughs. It, it's not like you go in there and people are like, what is this, you know? Um so yeah, yeah. I, I have found that and this is so I love hearing this because I have uh, I think I'm sure I've been doing comedy like uh, the least amount of time and so by the time I started doing comedy there's already such a network of independent rooms all I did were show I didn't do a club at all for like years because all there was was doing you know comedy in somewhere where no one wanted to see comedy like a bookshop or a lingerie bodega or uh, whatever but um i don't know and Chris, i want to know i want to know more about this lingerie bodega <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's just it's it's this is it's a useful definition because by the time i started alternative really did become a derisive byword for just like weird and that didn't like mean anything and it was just a way to like talk shit on people who did something you didn't get <laughs> yeah <laughs> Like up in San Francisco, you had some cool stuff that you guys had up there. Yeah, well, I grew well, I grew up here, and you know, I loved stand up as a kid, and it was my entire childhood dream to be a stand up. And I went to college in the Bay Area and came home to LA, and I was like, I'm gonna start stand up. And I went to the clubs, and you know, it was 2005 when I started. It's been 15 years now, and right before that, I saw it was Dave Coulier. And then the <laughs> hall, and our city hall called me a bitch for sitting in the front row, you know. And I was like, <laughs> and how am I going to get on stage here? You know, like how am I? And at the time, it was like the Dane train was going. It was in Chappelle. It was like all these big people. And so I just scurried back to San Francisco, where my first set was at a laundromat, and then they were at like black box. Oh, that food. was a great show. Oh, that was I I love that venue. It was, it, was, it was it was brainwashed, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's south of market. It's across the street from the prison, basically. Uh, but there's like a real community where like the host Tony Sparks would be 
like the first time he brings you up, he's like, your next comic is doing stand up for the first time or doing the brainwash for the first time. So you got to give them. And the whole crowd goes, a lot of love. And oh. I'm like, oh my God, this is <laughs> the opposite of Arsenio Hall right now. This is what I need. And so I just learned to um, kind of develop in those spaces. And in San Francisco, there's a good, you could kind of double dutch between the independent scene and the punchline. And luckily the punchline has an amazing booker that watches the show. But I feel like yes. the big difference is like, you go to these kind of clubs, you know, they're owned by uh, Goya or something. <laughs> uh, the booker never watches. And then I kind of feel like it's a difference between like a multi-cam show and uh, a single cam show sometimes. When you go to some of these big clubs and they're like, and here it comes, uh, you know, and, and some, clubs right here it was like oh here comes jerry the canary or something and there's like a guy named jerry just like it's kind of goofy but not in a good way um <laughs> i just kind of feel like the indie scene and these indie venues and uh bookers that actually curate the show kind of has helped comedy along in the last you know 20 25 years or yeah. something but in los angeles a lot of that in the last 10 years have come from mandy and joel booking the two shows that are just like the shows that everyone looks forward to. When you have nothing to look forward to in Los Angeles, when you're a comic, you're like, oh my God, I have Super Serious, which is only once a month, and then Hot Tub, which is, you know, every week. But yeah. then you're like, whoo, I got to get ready. And then you get excited. And you're like, I got to do some good stuff. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> and it's just like, I have this in my mind every time I book Chris that he's doing this little oh, dance. Yeah. <laughs> warm up, I'm just like. I mean, I think we all have a victory dance that we when we get booked on one of Joel and Mandy's shows, and we can all demonstrate right now. Like for Chris, it's this. For me, it's a little this. Yeah, we invented TikTok. Yeah, for me, it's for me, it's this. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, love, I don't know. Sir, I don't, I'm not sure exactly when all of you came to uh, LA, but I'm wondering about like. Because what's really great about the independent comedy as this system, but there is there is a divide between what a lot of us had to do, which is like weird shows and weird places. That, I mean, and, and and like an independent show can be so great and warm, but then there's logistically they can also be a nightmare. I mean, what what's great about like super serious show or people who just commit themselves to being an independent comedy producer in general is that you get the structural support maybe of a club and the warmth of like an indie show. But I'm curious, personally, as someone who hasn't done it for like, you know, 10 or 15 years in LA specifically, like what or was 30. there? Or like, 30. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I did my first mic like two weeks ago. So I, this is all, I'm just <laughs> learning experience for me. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> Like specifically in LA, you know, where I'm curious, curious about just like, is was there a period of like growing pains or, you know, what happens in between just everyone doing a free for all show in weird spaces versus like, you know, systems happening, like people like Joel and Mandy actually organizing shows with a little more structure, even like Sam, other, you know, independent producers like Sam Varela, but you know, now that there's several people in LA that make sure independent shows are, what's are great for what they are, but, um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Dude, maybe you have the most history in LA about like how the scene has ebbed and flowed. I mean, it definitely has seemed like I think James Domi called it like an amoeba, like it kind of grows and contracts as it's needed in the space based on the amount of comics and like what the scene needs. But how I mean, maybe you have the most insight into like how you know the independent scene has evolved over years. Ten or thirty. Yeah. Was that to Sarah? Was that to me or Sarah? Who just, who just You're the one who said you'd been doing stand up for 30 years. We want to know. <laughs> well, I started. I started in San Francisco, so for uh -huh. me, San Francisco was always sort of what alternative rooms are. I mean, mm -hmm. the Holy City Zoo was what we all do now in in alternative rooms. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, no, I think I think it's changed a lot. I think that um, you know it, it was certainly that thing that Sarah was talking about. Uh, before, which is you couldn't get on in rooms, and and uh, particularly in LA, you're talking about there's so many big comics that just take up stage time, and so you get bad spots if you do get spots, and so I think out of necessity, people started building these rooms, and then 
And then, but over time, I mean, it started with just like someone being like, I need more sets. I'll start a show and then I'll do comedy on them. <laughs> and then, and then they, and then they progress. And, and I want to say meltdown was the first one that felt almost professional. Mm, if that yeah, makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. It, it, it was, I mean, Jonah started it on Sunset as just like, I'm going to start doing this show in Kamel. And then they started doing a thing together. And, and But at that point, it became like a real thing in the audience. That was the first time an audience was like, we want to see this every week. And it just it just got so big so fast. And once everybody realized there was an audience for it, they started packing in. Like, Super Serious, I think, was before Meltdown, right? But uh, you guys there. weren't. Meltdown was monthly before us, and then we started in July of 2010, and then Meltdown went weekly in either August or September of 2010. Yeah, but, but you guys had to be there before us. Yeah, monthly. you guys, you guys also had to move around a little bit yeah. with the venues, which I think made it harder. Like for you, booking a show was a lot harder than for them booking a show because once you have that space, it's much easier. But you guys, I mean, you guys really had to do work. But, but we also I think that's the have thing. And host, like if you have a consistent host, then you build this yeah. up. The series never had that. We're like Kurt and Kristen host lots of every week, and so Jonah and Camille yeah. host meltdown every week. You know, so that's yeah. The thing. But yeah, I think and then Dave Ross with Holy Fuck, you know, in the downtown and the right. day, it was like a huge, you know, I think, and then that started in like November of two thousand nine. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. What's funny? I guess, I guess the. I guess the first thing would be Luna, Luna Lounge, which was, which was Beth Lapidus, who sort of ran it like a little dictator. So it wasn't, it, it was almost like a, a, an alternative room that was run like an actual comedy club where you got treated like shit and then everybody couldn't get in and it was just a few comics that could do it. But that was like the first sort of you know, what's, alternative. Room. <laughs> what's funny is that like talking, hearing people talk about how these rooms get built up out of a need. And by the time, but it like the scene does contract and expand out of necessity, like, you know, meltdown, super serious, all these things started just because people want a stage time. And, you know, when people talk about, I hate this word too, comedy, but by the time I started five years ago, those shows, my meltdown, super serious, hot tub, those felt like establishment shows that like, oh man, I can't get on there. Like I'm yeah. never gonna do. I remember the first time, and I had no understanding that there's a separation. Like I not, you know, I not really, I did clubs eventually, but that was just not my my bag. I didn't, that was just a whole other universe because there were so many shows. You just never had to set foot in a club. And I remember the first time I talked to someone in the industry who was like, oh, you need to like spread your wings and like, you know, don't just do these uh, indie shows, like these alt rooms, like hot tub. I was like, it's not an alt room. It's like the it's the biggest, coolest thing in the world. Like, who do you think you are, Mister Fancy Agent Man? <laughs> Acting like so. I don't know. It's, it's interesting what you said about this, like contracting and expanding, and like I, I don't know what that evolution has to be because then at some point, you know. And but it's weird. Like it was never in a bad way. It's never. I mean, I think we there's lots of indie shows and like Joel and Mandy shows particularly that always felt like a the thing you want to get to, but it never felt like exclusionary or awful the way club shows do. It wasn't like, oh, you're a comic? You hang out in the back of the Virgil and you get a crust of bread and a glass of water and then you rub Mandy's feet and then maybe we'll think about <laughs> booking you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know, I know like, yeah, we, I understand the impulse to not want to use independent or alternative to describe anything but the system, but it, it but like it, it is such a nice, it does connote what's just nice for spiritually about like you know systems outside of the comedy club system. Sarah, what did you notice the big difference was when you came to LA, like from the New York scene? Um, well, I was gonna say like I when I. Uh, first went to New York, I'd never seen stand up in person. <laughs> and I, I'd only seen it on TV. I really didn't know anything. I didn't do any research. Where, where did you come from? Where did uh, you Virginia. From? Um, okay. And I mean, I guess I could have thought of that. It's like I just walked out of the wood. I was raised by <laughs> Um, you know, I, I just didn't know anything. And like, 
I like hit up like UCB. I didn't know what kind of comedy I wanted to do. So I was trying like improv and sketch and doing all kinds of stuff. And I remember going to a little show in this basement there in the Lower East Side called B3. And it was hosted by Nick Kroll and Jesse Klein. I didn't know who they were. Um, it was crowded. And I mean, I just thought they sucked. I was like, this is <laughs> awful. I mean, I didn't know. I was comparing it to TV stand up. You know, Rosie O'Donnell with the flashlights. Like, I, I didn't know, you know. And so I, I'm like, this is horrible. Like, I was embarrassed when it's, things didn't get a laugh. It was too intimate. Like, you know, I, I just couldn't handle it. And I was like, I don't want to do this. And then they were like, we have a very special guest drop in. And his name is, um, maybe you've heard of him. His name is Dave Chappelle. Well, I was like, uh, no, I never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend was like, oh, he was in half baked. And I'm like, I've never smoked weed. I don't know anything about this. Where, do, where are you from? <laughs> and so where I go, you? Yeah. <laughs> he gets on stage, and it truly to this day is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. And that's when I understood. That's when I was like, oh, this is what real comedy is. And that was Dave Chappelle in a little independent room. And it was, I had tears streaming on my face. It felt like he made it all up, which he probably did because I didn't realize the genius I was seeing. And then like six months later, his show came out, you know, or in the next year or two, this is, it's all a blur back then. I don't know. I've been doing it 18 years at this point, but, um, and so that's the world I came up in. And then I learned it very slowly and painfully. And then when I came to LA, it was like I had, I went straight to New York. I'd never, again, never seen it, never tried it. And was like, just maybe it was too much fire too quick. But then when I moved to LA, it was like I had a second chance to start in a new place. And so I, I was more calculated. And obviously I had done a lot more. I'd had my TV show, I was fresh off my MTV show. But I still didn't know anybody here, and I uh, I took it very seriously. And I was like, I'm doing my gold material at every show for <laughs> I, for a year. I, I didn't stray. I was like, I don't know who's in these audiences. I heard that Justin Bieber was at a show. I'm like, I'm not fucking around. You know, there's no fucking way I'm gonna try out a new joke for a year. He was 12 years old at the time. <laughs> <laughs> He was a pacemaker. Um, but yeah, I, I came out here a little intimidated, but I also came out during a time where it was a mass exodus of comedians coming to LA. Kurt and Kristen, and, I mean, everybody I knew was moving out here. And so I felt a little bit safer, but it was like, oh, there's a whole scene here and they don't know me. And I have to prove myself and be humble. And, you know, in New York, I could get booked on a show every single night very easily by that point. Here it was like begging, you know, like I'm sending them like I had a I had a TV show. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, sending I, this is and, this is amazing to hear because by the five years ago, I think is when everyone was complaining about the comedy bubble like reaching some sort of apex. So I, if you could just, I also had never really seen live comedy, and I've lived in LA my whole life. And I had to, I was, I was, I grew up, my, my parents were from Mexico and I grew up in East LA and I was probably cleaning the floors of the comedy club. That's what I was doing. I was taking out the trash, but I just had a whole other life and a whole other career. And then one day I just, I got into comedy cause I Googled LA to open mics and I was like, well, this place is close to me and it's a shack called echoes under sunset but I, it's close by and i'm gonna go there um but yeah that percent it was totally but it was like at the time and i think there were just it was when there were so many shows going on everywhere like oh i got a show in this shoe box there's a show in here everyone was like oh you're a new comic you want to get better start a show um and they were all starved for comics so like if you could go to an open mic and like put a sentence together People were like, oh, come do my show, you know? Um, I, I don't know that that was necessarily better or worse, you know? And some people were very choosy and some people would just, all right, you know, without even vetting you would say like, yeah, you can do my show. I mean, if you want to eat shit in front of everybody, that's up that's to you. <laughs> um, but I'm, that's such a funny uh, 
you know, difference from like the, I guess, hearing that perspective from the New York scene versus LA. And I don't know, Dave or Chris, like, and the scene's always changing, but if there was any sort of what surprised you, what was shocking about even just the independent scene in LA versus the Bay Area? Well, the Bay, I mean, it's been in the Bay for a while. And it, it yeah, yeah. Of there. I mean, if it's the Holy City Zoo, and then there was Dana Gould, and, you know, you and Karen, Dave, and Patton, and Blaine, there was like a whole wave of like amazing comics that came out of the Bay. So it was just kind of normal there. I mean, that was just kind of the vibe. You know, like the punchline was still a great club. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you could do pubs and stuff, but um, that's what I was used to. So when I came here, I was like, I get this all away. Uh, like, and I, when I left San Francisco, I was like, I was, I was you know, one of the good ones, you know? And I yeah. just showed up and I felt like I showed up with like a, my hat in hand, like a 1920s. I was like, wow, I'm ready to work, everybody. Like, I just like stood outside the store for like days, just like, I guess I'll just. Sit, stand out here and maybe I'll talk to some weirdos and, and I I knew some people but not really and no it, it's just tough it's really intimidating to yeah be in here did and you ever so, have I was gonna did you specifically did you ever have that because I started here so to me I'm like well this like, is awful it's just a given did you ever have someone really huge like drop into a show or show up at a mic and suddenly you were like, oh shit. And I feel like I've heard that that is a thing that seemed very specific to LA, that even if you're trying to just start out and hone your craft at like mics and tiny shows, there's always a chance that someone huge is just gonna watch you bomb. And it's, you know, I'm humiliating. Um, Larry David oddly showed up at a show and just sat there and I was, uh, I didn't know he was there, and I was just doing something real weird. I was just doing a weird character that made no sense. Yeah, and it, was really you were, bad. it was real bad. Like you were we, doing you were doing all comedy. I've heard. Is that what you were? Is that what you would say? <laughs> oh yeah, I was really. I was throwing a lot of spaghetti. I was like, I'm just gonna go do this. Fuck it. And then I get off, and it's, it's like not even a sympathy clap. And I get off, and I'm like. Wow. And then he, I like looked at his eyes and I've never seen such a dead look at his face. Anyone I like just got up and he left. Like I walked. Very walked very I, feel like, I feel like this is so specific to Olay and this is a good in, a lead into what I wanted to ask Mandy about how, about the booking specifically like for Super Serious because what's so great is that there tends to be a mix of, I think, and I know you hate this. People who are generally do weirder stuff outside of the comedy club system and very seasoned traditional club comics together on a bill. And that's part of the magic of the show. I my favorite thing is to try and do something so so goddamn stupid that the club comic after me has to talk about it before they can go on with their set. But <laughs> there was a show that Super Serious show that we booked the Apple Sisters, um, which is Sarah Lowe, Kimmy Gatewood, and Rebecca Johnson, and doing one of their bits that they and they made the stage really, really messy. And Dave, you're gonna you're gonna like this specifically. They like spilled all these noodles or something all over the stage. And when Joel and I were putting the lineup together, we're like, oh, you know who we want to have follow them? We want to have Mark Maron follow them. Because <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, like you, you don't get to do fun things like that when you know the comics more and you know how like they'll react to stuff. Like you, it is you, you had me follow a guy in a tomato outfit once. I just yeah, that that. Makes, I feel like that. Makes, <laughs> like, news, Dave. I mean, it's almost like a troll. I was gonna ask, is that something you? I mean, you would. I know you would never. It's not ever in like a mean way. And what's great about club comics is like they really can just handle anything so they're like yeah. well, we, would, we would never put anybody like we only would put somebody like after like a, a weird sketch that made the stage messy or a, a magician or a guy in a tomato costume something weird like that we'd only put somebody who was a seasoned vet who could handle anything you know yeah 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 we never put like a younger comic who is you know maybe more nervous or just maybe well you know maybe has a thing or whatever we would never like fuck with them but if we're like, we know somebody well enough, we're like, you can follow anyone. And so this is a good spot for you to follow somebody who's maybe more challenging for other comedians. So this, this is why I get frustrated with, and I'm holding my scissors up when I say this, <laughs> why I get frustrated with the club alt label. 
is because mm -hmm. you're, you're what you're saying is experience. Yeah, comic. yeah well, experience. It's That's right. Not club because no. club comics. It doesn't matter. It, it, there's so many club comics I've seen that would not would fucking melt down if they had to follow <laughs> some weird act, and they would spend their whole act melting down, having a nervous breakdown about the death of comedy or something. You know, <laughs> I shouldn't have to follow that. It's, you know, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, having been in that exact scenario, <laughs> and I won't say when, but for a long time at a comedy festival where there was one weird act amongst the group and everyone would fight about who had to follow. And these were club comics having to fight who had to follow the weird act. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That, you know what's funny is it does, I think people are uh, less, it's not so ones, I, I really don't think club, well, I don't know. The only club I did regularly was the improv and I would try to like play it both ways in that like, the independent shows are so cool because you can really see a diverse lineup like that. And then when they're put together thoughtfully, it's amazing. It's amazing to watch, you know, a weird person who doesn't really care if their thing is anti-comedy, just like be themselves. And then it's amazing to see an experienced comic just like take their weird spaghetti act and then turn that into some jokes. And then, yeah, yeah. but even that like, uh, you know, I've done really, I think it's also a question of audience, which are not that different. I've seen some weirdly weird things at clubs and people are almost more psyched to see it because it's like more unexpected, you know? Yeah, I don't I know. Think, oh, go ahead, Dave. I, I think that there, I think it's about vulnerability and I think it's harder to show vulnerability in a, a regular club. And I think you can show vulnerability in uh, the independent rooms. I, I think one example is, like I, when I went up the last show I did at your room when I talked about how much how happy I was my dad was dead. I don't think you could I don't think you could ever do that in a normal comedy club. I think people would totally freak out. But they really loved it there, and that's just the like I feel like I could be I can be brutally honest in an independent room, and I cannot be brutally honest in a regular club. I think that always comes back to like this very specific, and it doesn't seem if you're not in comedy, maybe it doesn't make sense. But I think it is the distinction. And I'm a person who I'm like comedy clubs have their place. They pay comedians. They help them tour. Like yeah. they're not they're not bad. They're just different. But I think that in independent rooms, you have to talk to the audience. And in sometimes comedy clubs, you talk at the audience. Yeah. And so it's like presentational versus intimate. You know, like versus an experience versus a dialogue maybe in an independent room. And in a comedy club, they've come from more of a show. They have dinner and drinks. And maybe the comics also feel more of a responsibility. Like those people got sitters, they pay high ticket prices, they're dead. Yeah. They're probably in a hundred bucks, you know. But in an independent room, maybe they're in ten dollars a year, you know. You owe them something. I I um yeah, and I really appreciate the, the mindset that like, these are different systems, but they don't have to be in opposition and they kind of feed each other. And it almost, it almost did it. They're yeah. In a perfect world, they do feed each other. And like, if you look at where the store has come now, like there are mm -hmm. so many quote unquote alternative comedians who book the store. And, and that's because ultimately media gets saturated by writers like Sarah and Chris and Dave, you know, and other people like Tucker Lajero, Sarah Silverman, Zach Galpinakis, who were quote-unquote alternative comedians, but then become mainstream in the media because they provide content that people want to watch, you know? Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. There's, it's, you know, it's like a Neo-Mr. Smith kind of balance because I would say it's a challenge because I started at a point where there were so many indie shows. You could just do like five shows a week without ever sitting foot in the club. And then I remember the first... It was uh, the first time I tried doing a club. It was very like, oh, I'm not as tight as I think I am. Like it, for better or worse, whether you like the vibe or whether the people are mean, it's like, there's just a level of professionalism that you don't know is expected of you until you're there. And it was definitely a learning experience, but there's different, I don't know. There's, I, I, not even that that was necessarily my path and I can't, and I wanted to like stay there, but it was like, Oh, this is a, there's a, just a different skill set, obviously involved in being able to like do something like this consistently. But you said something really interesting. Oh, sorry. This is my makeup brush. I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I'm not gonna lie, I was scared about okay, getting Sarah, sweaty. Sarah has scissors, Sarah has scissors, Christina has makeup brushes, I have like three different glasses. I was worried about getting oh, real clean. Like you guys don't have a lot of scissors. Oh my god, what's happening, Sarah? I have a lot of stuff all around. <laughs> I do not make Sarah mad if we're close by. Um, I don't, how much time, Sam? Uh, or I don't need to brag, but I'm rich. <laughs> wow, wow, wow! Wow! I was ready. Really the weight in my crafting. It's a whole thing. Anyway, we um, have. How much time do we have? I think we have ten minutes left. Or are we? Are we over at seven? Or can Sam or someone in the chat <laughs> confirm them? I was gonna ask Sarah and Chris and Dave, like how much do you guys think, like, cause you guys all write for uh, television and you do things in order the mainstream media, like how has like being able to like work in the independent spaces helped you guys work in that space? I'm gonna let Sarah, Sarah's thinking, so I'm gonna let Sarah answer it. She's deep in thought. Um, I think, uh, well, for me, independent, independent shows ultimately are about access, um, and there's more of them outside of the club system, so it's more stage time and more time for you to develop your voice as a writer, and you can maybe, uh, once you get to know a show, you might feel comfortable at that show. You know the audience, you know the venue, you know the kinds of, com you know, oh, I, you know what I could try out at that room? You know what, what they would let me get away with? You know, and you can try something new, like what Dave was saying. You can be a little more honest, um, take risks, um, and fail and still get booked again, like Mandy has done with me many times. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that translates into being able to write. Um, and I think seeing a variety of acts when you're, you know, doing the shows, you know, not, not everybody watches other comics all the time, but, you know, you absorb a lot. And then you get to know what other comedians are doing, their voices, which makes it possible for you to potentially write for them one day. And it forms a community and a network in its own way um, that leads to job opportunities down the line. And so you're always trying to show off your writing in some way or another on those stages because you know that the guy next week is going to announce that he's hiring writers or, you know, to... Uh, for their show. And you're like, remember how funny I was? It's super serious. Or, you know... <laughs> You want me in your writer's room. Is that specific to LA? Oh, no, it's in New York, too, because New York has a fair amount yeah. of comedy variety shows, like all the talk shows and stuff. And so that's always been a great place to try out, you know, your more monologue-y type jokes and, and stuff like that. But it, this, there's just as many out here as well. So Yeah, my, my first writing gig came because Bob Odenkirk saw me in an alternative room. And he was like, do you want to write on this pilot and work on? Like right there after the show. I think I think for me, it was uh, it's a little bit different because I got to write on Marin, which is sort of, I mean, that that's alternative comedy in itself in a way. What? Are you calling that cheating? <laughs> well, I mean, I, it's definitely not the kind of writing that, you know, like when Sarah's writing for uh, The Tonight Show, that's a whole different animal, whereas Maren, you're literally just got this tiny audience and you just really get to do what you want. And there's no rules, Everyone, they just go do what you want and have a good time. So it really was like almost like an alternative television show. We got three notes per script and we could ignore all of them. So that's just like <laughs> completely, completely unheard of. So, you know, for me, when I now get a writing job, I it, it, like it, it will never compare to that again because I, I, I got to do everything I wanted, you know? Chris, have you um, have you gotten a writing gig just off of someone seeing you at an indie show? It's happened to me. It's very exciting. It uh, looks like it happened to everybody. No, I, well, I got my podcast that way from doing. Um, oh. I did two dope queens. Yeah. And so then WNYC asked me if I wanted to do a podcast, and it was because of that, you know. And that was at the Terragram, uh, <laughs> which usually does rock shows, so it's yeah, not a traditional yeah. venue. And I just had an especially present, vulnerable set that I didn't really think about before that I just let it fly. You yeah. know, and I was just like, this is what's in my heart. I don't even know what's going on. It was like a yeah. blur. Yeah. And then that, that 
um, kind of almost changed my life, you know? Yeah. And so because of that, I got to talk about the thing that I've always wanted to talk to about, but never did fully. And I got the opportunity to because I presented just a glimpse of it in an alternative space. Yeah. So that's, that's part of the. Really I think that's cool. a weird. Yeah, I think that's a weird Hollywood magic that's specific to like independent scene. And I want to see even tied to what you said, Dave, about like the vulnerability of an indie room and like the fact that it's in LA and it comes together. I um, yeah, I got my first. I did a I did a bar show in in downtown. And I actually was in such a shit mood, I almost canceled the show. I just didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do stand up, but I was like, I don't want to do stand up, and I'm in such a fucking bad mood. What's gonna? I just want to have a good time tonight. What can I do to make that happen? And I ended up singing karaoke and like making some guy in the audience eat shrimp off my face, and then. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> no, we and, all have. And you know, and, and Eric on right before you did it. <laughs> and, Eric, <laughs> and Eric Andre just happened to drop in that night working on stuff for his new tour. And you know, he didn't even say anything. He was just, and the only reason he even saw me, because you know that when larger people drop in the shows, they want to get in and out. The only reason he even saw my set is because I was on right before him. And he just uh, kind of like, you know, shook. And then afterward, he was just like, hey, man, great shit, and left. And then six months later, yeah, I get like an email from an assistant. And that's, yeah. I think this is maybe a good lead in. I think into our what I wanted to have our be our final topic, which is sad. Um, but I don't know how we're adapting and what comedy is like now, because it seems like what the independent scene fosters is these social connections that are super important, not just personally in terms of. I think we've all met some of our best friends by doing these shows, but and I think it's and professionally, weirdly, how independent comedy helps foster those connections in a really organic way. And now it's gone in a way, but like we're, we're doing this now and we're talking to each other. Um, I guess if anyone wants to, uh, I'm interested in what anyone's prognostications are on how the sort of like this really important, like weird social professional crossover thing that's so important to independent comedy you know, is that still happening right now? Do you feel like that's happening with these like Zoom shows and live stream stuff or tweeting? <laughs> Everyone just looks bummed. Sarah. <laughs> Sarah. Sarah's just shaking her head. No. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't do a lot of the Zoom shows. I've only done like one or two and I just really despised it. Um, just as an, an experience of doing stand up, I didn't like it. Um, but that's not to say it hasn't worked for others. And I've seen shows being done that are like, they, they're adapting, they're changing, and they're doing things in an interesting way. Um, but I look at it as a pause. Um, unfortunately, it's one that causes great financial damage to a lot of people, including venues, producers, and comedians. I'm very lucky to have writing work, but I think about people who don't have that and that's really upsetting. So I've noticed that people are just staying in touch as friends, you know, texting and social distance hangouts outside and things like that. But the shows I think are on pause. And I, I just, aside from the financial stress of it, um, you know, I have a friend who's very worried about her stand up suffering from this pause. And I'm like, I've been through phases where I don't perform for a long time. And I'm like, you're gonna be fine. You'll pick it back up. You know, it is like riding a bike. You will be rusty. You know, it'll take a minute, but and and maybe you will have incubated a lot of stuff to talk about and new material. And so, um, everyone I know, every comedian I know, is has to be so scrappy to begin with that we're finding a way through it. But I just can't fucking wait to perform again in a real. Yeah. A real venue, yeah. not, out, not outdoors, not all that, just the real way. I can't wait. I yeah. miss the catharsis of it so much. Like I had, I've done a couple Zoom shows and last week I did a, a I had like, I did 45 minutes on Zoom and I was dreading it so much. I was like, this is stupid. Why am I doing this? I've never tried a lot of this stuff out. And then afterwards I was like, 
I'm on. I feel like I was like, I'm on PTP. <laughs> First night it opens. I'm in Mexico. Like I just real. I was like, I need this so much. And then I was like, oh, okay, I'm a latchkey kid who needs approval from strangers. And then, like, we're gonna go away. And I really need this, and I just missed it so much. And I, I've been listening. You know, it's it seems like a commercial or something, but I've missed stand up so much. And last week was last couple of weeks, it's up and down, you know, especially when we've been doing it for the time, we're used to doing it all the time. And seriously, I was like, your book, Mandy, I was like, made me remember loving stand up, you know? I was like, oh my yeah. God, I'm reading all these quotes from friends and the community that you feel and seeing these pictures and even remembering like everyone, like I, I'm, I wasn't as confident when I moved to LA as I am now, which is still not all the way confident. But when I, the first pictures of my, my super series, I'm like, I'm probably like, <laughs> I'm not in the book. I mean, I have one picture in the book. It's a little one, but I was like, that's the picture when I felt comfortable. It's super serious. All the other ones, <laughs> it, it feels like it's a real beautiful time capsule of this moment right before stand up was comment stand up was gone forever no i'm just kidding i uh, know but like i just feel like it's so comforting to read this and know that it's going to be back and this is just a little blip and uh hopefully maybe a year or something it'll be back and we're all going to be bad but i think it's going to be really fun for us yeah. to be bored and for crowds like your crowds that come to your shows man you're going to be like so excited to come back to see us all eat it and figure it out. And then, you know, in a couple of months, we'll be back. But It's like edging. I can't wait for all the rest of these shows when we start again. I yeah, really No one's going to know how to hold a microphone. I'm going to come on stage. Nobody <laughs> knows how to hold a microphone now. I, I bought my own mic just so yeah. I was like, just in case when it comes back, just a regular SM58 that you have at the club <laughs> mic. <laughs> I it up, I it up and it was it was so heavy and i was like this is so sad like i'm helping these things for so long and i was like Ugh. it was like i, I want to see people in airpods doing live comedy that's just the thing that comes back and what i um I think we need to wrap up soon oh uh, we're it's this it's not a tight schedule okay then never mind um what I was want to say, well, but it isn't. It's not. It's not a. Process. So we're gonna. Okay, whenever you feel like, because we can go till midnight for all I. You know, I'm having a, <laughs> about this question about. Uh, Sarah's like. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, I'm hungry. Dave, I you're totally low about this, and then we can wrap up. No, you're so totally low key take on Zoom, Dave. <laughs> I don't. To me, it's not. I mean, I, I think it's great that people can get what Chris got out of it. To me, it's not stand up. So. Uh, and I and I, I do like Sarah said like uh, we're, Sarah and I and, and people who stand up but can work in other ways we're just super lucky like I, I can't say how lucky we are with what's going on and I just know stand ups out there who I've talked to and I've been like why are you doing Zoom shows and they're like it's all I have this is all that I do and it, it's so sad to have that taken away from them. So part of me says, I don't want to do Zoom shows because I don't want to take the place of those people. Um, and then the other part of me is, is that it's not, it just doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like stand-up to me. You know, I've gotten very sort of picky about stand-up over the years. I used to love to do clubs. And then when I started doing more alternative rooms, I don't like clubs at all anymore. And, mm -hmm. and because I can make my living somewhere else, I really want to choose my venues mm -hmm. that I like. And so this goes into that. Like, I, I don't want to do this on, uh, uh, you know, stand up mm -hmm. like this. To me, it, I, to me, it would be super sad, no matter how much, how well it went or whatever, I still think it would make me sad at the end of the day that this, this is what it is. Yeah, I can say is like producing Hot Tub on Zoom, it's definitely different and weird. Uh, I think that me and Jalab approached it with like short sets and a little bit more like show and tell where some people have kind of done stand up and some people have just, it's like a weird version of like a blog to stand up ratio, you know, but yeah. it's, it's also weirdly comforting still to look at all your friends' faces in tiny boxes mm -hmm. for an hour, you know, yeah. and it's, it's like, I think Kristen has said it a lot in the show that like, it's weird, but it still like feels emotionally like there's something emotionally that you still get out of it in the green room and yeah. like, the time. 
it's not the same. And I can't wait to squish strangers into a room way too close together and way too packed again to watch a stand up show. Yeah, um, it's going to be great. I mean, people are going to be frothing at the mouth. Like, they're going to laugh at anything. I mean, we're going to go out there and just be like, I'm, I'm no, going to live it. I'm, I'm going to dry hump everybody in the audience. I'm going <laughs> to. And obviously, there are shows happening, but like, when it, I mean, who knows what that moment will be and if it's gradual and it might not be this glorious moment I'm imagining, but. I think there's going to be a point where it really does open back up again and it's going to feel really good. Yeah. 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 And uh, something cool and special. And, and I'm, I think we're all very excited about that as a community. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, and what's so beautiful <laughs> and, but like painfully beautiful about the book coming out at this moment, because it is so many interviews with so many great comedians. <laughs> Uh, and some like some well really famous people and some like not famous people all sharing like what makes this discipline so special and this like system so special and i think a lot of stuff we like to disingenuously frame it as like well it's so prescient or like in these times you know we can really appreciate but it really does come at a moment when like super serious you know buttoning up like a 10-year run of this show and also being a really really important i think document of like a history that is not over but like definitely in an interregnum state and evolving and going to be something else when it's done yeah, um, i've been calling it a time capsule it is so just, beautiful yeah I, I i i've also felt after looking at the book i mean just when you combine it with the pandemic of like that i i will never take it for granted again oh my god i'm gonna yeah. cry <laughs> i know <laughs> yeah yeah, I, mean, I sat on the toilet and I cried reading the book. <laughs> oh, I, I always cry in the toilet. <laughs> what do you do with the book? Yeah, I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell if it was the book or me, but it was happening at the same time. There's this, there's this great quote from Bronger in the book. I think he put it on his Instagram and made fun of me for including it. But he talks about how comedy will always survive because we're the scrappiest of the entertainment industry and it comes from like more of a place i mean i think he called us all rats in a sewer too but like <laughs> I, like you know of like more instinctual human connection and like need for like it's a simplistic thing of like an audience and a person telling an audience something you know and it's something that we can all do on our own we don't need a whole big approval system like we can just when we can go back into the spaces and have audience, like we can just do it again. We don't need anyone to like help us do it again, you know, and, and how that comedy will just always survive because of who the people are that make the comedy will always want it to survive. Yeah. yeah. And there's so many people. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. And there's like literally uh, dozens and hundreds of people in this book, like all making that happen. So. Thank you, Mandy. I know you didn't make the pandemic happen, but thank you for the timing. Um, you know, and I, got, <laughs> I got the first book like three months ago. I was like, this already feels like a bygone era. And it just feels like that more and more every day you read it. But I, I'm happy that we at least have a record of free pandemic comedy now. Yeah. So. And it's, yeah, it's just, it's so, it's just too weirdly perfect because it is a record of free pandemic comedy and it's its own record of like it's very specific show and time and place that was going to evolve anyway so yeah thank you um thank you all for being part of this and you know for being part of the book and being part of this launch event it was very as sarah can attest it's very nerve-wracking to have your book come out in a pandemic and try to find uh, yeah. meaningfully promote and market it so and yeah that you guys all did this with me. yes 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 and actually i did want to point out um Chris, you're the only comedian here who hasn't written a book. So, but he has um, this podcast. You know, I have a critically acclaimed, acclaimed podcast that was next. <laughs> one of, the, one of the Time same. Magazine's best 10 of last year, but I guess I'll write a book. <laughs> we could, we could, well, we, we, I, that would be great because we were kind of, we were getting kind of worried about you. Is yeah, we thought yeah, like, well. well I don't know. The Atlantic thought my podcast was pretty good. So, uh, I don't even understand half of the words in there. So, that's There's, an achievement. Okay, I'll write a book next. I think it's so great that your podcast came from like 
to Dub Queens, but it also came from like an independent space that fits like 400 people, which wouldn't normally be what people consider independent spaces. They always consider them tiny and small and like little. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? But I think that there's something very cool about those things all combined, you know? So. Yeah. I'm this proud of you, Chris. I'm proud of you. Thank you. I'm proud of you, Chris. This is really great. Thank you, Kara. My parents worked really hard when I was a kid. So <laughs> uh, and so I would watch the Cosby show to feel better. But now I feel good again now that you gave me positive <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I did. I did. Uh, okay, just a little bit. Not too much, just a little bit. But um, I've had such a nice time talking to you guys and getting to know you a little better. And I can't thank, uh, I'm going to want to cry again. I think all of us have been personally affected by Mandy's work, not just as like a producer and a comedian, but as like an amazing person and a photographer with such, uh, the amount of like, prescience to begin a project like this 10 years ago and have it be able to culminate so perfectly is uh is truly Randy photographed my wedding and i wouldn't have been <laughs> other comedy producers near my family or my <laughs> yeah that's a lot that's so <laughs> true <laughs> It's a it's a gift to comedians it's a gift to coffee table books it's a gift to photography and anyone who is just I'm excited for for someone who's like a new comic that's like frustrated right now to just like read this book and get so fucking psyched about about what's going to happen next and how they're going to be a part of it. So, thank you. Do we do we clap? I don't I don't know. It's these virtual events. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody who tuned in and watched us talk for an hour, it was really nice of you all to do that. Thank, thank you me. so much, everybody, um, okay. for joining us. Thank you. And then yeah. take us away, Sam. Yeah. 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 Don't actually take us away. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, everyone who tuned in. And please, at Book Soup, you can get a signed copy. So you should especially get them with us. And thank you all for taking the time. This was a really fun chat, and I even for writers every anyone who wants to do anything creative is really great so thank you all for joining us and congratulations andy and we'll talk to you all soon thank you bye everybody